uh, accounting firm to get rid of that. But they're making more money in America now than they ever did before. They're more professional. They're more independent. And what's more, what's more, they now have a real client. In the past, again, and we're seeing this repeated in many parts of the world, so it's not just the American experience we're talking about here. It's a trend in global governance. What do you want the auditor to do? You want them to be independent and talk frankly to you about your reporting system and the numbers. You want to make sure those numbers are trustworthy. They're going to have that conversation and be independent, provided they have a real client. So the audit committee is the real client. The audit committee should have the power to hire and fire and set the compensation uh, with the outside auditor. And if you're going to take that step, then that audit committee needs to be independent from management. And so strict rules of independence need to apply, not just to the auditor, but to the auditor's client, which is the audit committee. And that audit committee needs to be staffed with people who understand financial statements. Uh, and that's the quality. Uh, the quality that you're going to get out of your auditor and an understanding and trustworthiness is going to be directly proportional to how independent that audit committee is. And the people who sit on that committee need to have a terrific, strong background in f the financial reporting. And if that's the case, then, then the additional step you want to make sure is that annually that audit committee meets with the auditor and finds out some of the following. One, when we look at these financial statements prepared under IFRS, what are the critical? Identify the three to five most critical judgments, estimates, choices that were made in preparing these statements. I mean, what were they? And then the next question is, why did you make those? How did that make the presentation more fairly present the position and performance of the firm? That's the two most important questions that needs to be asked. Those are the same questions that on those executive certifications that work their way up the organization and which ultimately they land on the CEO's desk. The CEO needs to turn to his or her direct report, the treasurer or the controller, whoever's in charge of the financial system, and say, okay, what are the critical estimates? What are the critical judgments? What were the critical choices here that were made in preparing these statements? Why were they critical? How did they change things from last year? What assumptions would have changed these differently? We're not talking about fraud here. We're talking about, I need to know how this business is operating. And I can't do that without knowing all the assumptions that went into preparing these numbers. Now, the other thing that the audit committee ought to do is sort of a watchdog, is they need to look a little bit more broadly than the re information being submitted to them by the, uh, um, um, up the organization by the auditor. Annually, they ought to go back and look at all the releases uh, by the CFO and the CEO uh, talking about the firm's performance and the position, et cetera, that, that, uh, whether they be with investment analysts like that, to see if the outward image that's being projected by them is consistent with the financial information that's coming up to the board at that time. That's just a way of keeping up to date on what's happening. Um, now, one final question here. I may be appearing to you as somebody who's coming and speaking on a different planet. That's because we know in so much of the world, not just Asia, but certainly in large parts of Europe, that you have the control shareholder, whether it be a state-owned enterprise or you have a family ownership. Uh, and you say, how can you manage this? Even our listing requirements uh, for the NAS, uh, NASDAQ or, or, or a New York Stock Exchange carve out majority-owned listed subsidiaries from the requirement that you have to have a majority of the outside directors. I mean, we're, even in America, we can sometimes be realist, okay? So uh, I want to be realist, too. I'm not saying that state-owned enterprise 
needs to have a majority of the outside directors be independent. I don't think that's, that that makes sense. Uh, and, but I, what I am saying, that when it comes to the audit committee, you need to have a sector of the board which is on that audit committee, which is not dominated by the outside person. And the final point I'll say, that is a winning solution for the controlling stockholder. Study after study after study shows that when you have a controlling dominant stockholder, there is a substantial control discount in every market in the country. And one way of uh, reducing that discount and therefore reducing the cost of capital of the firm and making sure that the organization is perceived as trustworthy and reliable is by introducing a strong independent audit committee. These are individuals that are not going to be bomb throwers. They're not going to get be obstructionists at the board level. It's in your interest to make sure that the, the numbers that are getting out there are trustworthy, reliable, perceived as trustworthy, perceived as reliable, because if you're a repeat player in capital markets, you don't want to pay the maximum control party discount. You want to minimize that as much as possible, and that's why it's your interest to do that. Our second speaker, Barrister John Brewer, looks at the responsibility of investors to protect themselves against less than honest sales practices. He alerts investors to the dangers of believing what he calls the beautiful lies of sales staff who promise high returns with little risk. He starts by using the example of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac to illustrate that there is no such thing as a safe investment. I'm going to try very uh, hard to uh, lighten up um, some of the issues. Um, there's a lot of heavy material been discussed yesterday, and you may be wondering why the title of what I've um, proposed to talk about is as it is, Beautiful Lies, True Lies, and Investor Protection. Well, the answer to that is, trust me, I'm a lawyer. Before I get into that, um, it occurred to me that there might be a bit of coverage of last week's nationalization in the US of two fairly prominent financial institutions. And before anybody imagines that all of this has come as a bit of a shock, let's go back four years. Four years ago, um, Fannie Mae said that S&P's governance service has affirmed its score on a scale of 10 being 9 judging governance practices to be very strong on a global scale. Um, September 22nd, however, two days after a report that was issued by the uh, body responsible for oversight, stated that the accounting methods and practices do not comply with GAAP in accounting for derivative transactions and hedging activities. And I mentioned this nasty word, derivatives. That's one of the themes I'm going to be um, plugging this morning, is the dangers of derivatives. The other theme is securitization, because that is what Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac were doing on a big scale, and it's the dangers of too much securitization, which I think has probably led to their downfall. Um, however, at the same time, their CEO was trying to reassure investors. Specifically, we hold enough capital, this is four years ago, we hold enough capital to survive 10 years of financial and economic stress where interest rates spike or plummet by as much as 600 basis points. On top of that, we have to add another 30% of capital to protect us against management or operations failure and other unspecified risks. However, one of the politicians was a little less sanguine, and um, his reaction was that investors had been fooled, home buyers had been cheated, taxpayers are at risk. I wonder if he's going to be giving us the same kind of words today or whether it'll be 10 times as strong. Fool us once, shame on you. Fool us twice, shame on us. He didn't say what happens when you get fooled three times. <laughs> and this was the announcement made by the regulator at the time. And there was an agreement made with, with Fannie Mae to implement correct accounting treatments, appoint independent chief risk officers, and put in place policies to assure adherence to accounting rules and in new internal controls. 
Um, this agreement, the last line, this agreement is an important